Hello everyone and welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather, this is my greenhouse, and once again it's time to harvest tomatoes. Between here and the raised bed garden, I have around 70 to 75 tomato plants. And where that sounds like a lot, it actually takes a lot of tomatoes to make many of the tomato products that we know and love. Our family consumes a lot of tomato sauce and salsas, so that's what I'm going to be making today with a little bit of a bonus. We're also going to be making a tomato powder out of the tomato skins. It's a really great addition to a wide variety of dishes, and it's really a super great way to use the entire fruit. But first we have to harvest. So if you're wondering about the white substance here on my plants, this is actually a product called BT, and I have it on the plants in here because we had a pretty serious hornworm problem in the greenhouse specifically. BT is approved for organic gardening and you can use it up until the day of harvest. So some of our tomatoes will probably have a little bit of a powdery substance on them, but it's completely fine. So these tomatoes, when they are fully ripe, are going to ripen a nice deep cherry red. I go ahead and remove the tomatoes when they are about 30% ripe. There's really no scientific way to tell when something is about 30% ripe, but in general for me, if the tomato is orange, that's when I'm gonna pick it. If it's a little bit green still, I'm gonna leave it on the plant and I'll get it in a couple days. See this one I'm gonna leave but something like this, I'm gonna take. are what we've been getting about every two to three days. Now I'm not gonna use these tomatoes right away. I'm gonna let them ripen for a few days inside and then they'll be perfect. I should have clarified too that you don't need 75 tomato plants or 50 pounds of tomatoes in order to create any of the recipes that I'm gonna show you today. Now, the recipe that I have for tomato sauce is from the National Center for Home Food Preservation. I'll be sure to link it in the description box below. It does require almost 50 pounds of tomatoes to do the full batch of seven quarts. If you want to be able to do the full batch and you don't have 50 pounds of ripe tomatoes, you can freeze your tomatoes in batches until you have enough. So this is one that I actually froze yesterday and I'm actually thawing it out today. And that seems a little counterintuitive. Why would you freeze something just to thaw it out? But it has its benefits. This is a gallon size Ziploc bag full of quartered ripe tomatoes and it weighs seven pounds. So I know that if I wanna do a full canner load of tomato sauce, I need to thaw out seven bags, which is about 49 pounds. See all this juice down here? The benefit of freezing your tomatoes and then thawing them out, even if you just freeze them the day ahead of time, is that as the tomatoes thaw out, they're going to release all of their juices, or at least most of them, and the skins are going to slip right off. It's really, really gonna cut down on our processing time because we won't have to be simmering the sauce on the stove for hours trying to get it to the right consistency. Most of the liquid just comes out as it thaws out. But while we're waiting on that last bag of tomatoes to thaw out, I'm actually gonna get a batch of roasted salsa done. I also had a friend ask me if it was okay to process or preserve grocery store food. And the answer is absolutely. 
I happen to have grown most of the components going in to the salsa and sauce today, but that is definitely not always the case. If you have homegrown tomatoes, but you don't have something like jalapenos, garlic, onions, no worries, you can totally use the store-bought options. I originally got this recipe from Jess over at Roots and Refuge Farm, and this recipe technically is not approved for canning. I am going to be canning it today, but understand that this is rebel canning at its finest. So if you do choose to copy exactly what I'm doing here and you choose to can it, make sure you understand that you're doing so at your own risk. All right, disclaimers aside, all I'm doing is coring the tomatoes and quartering them and layering them here on my sheet pan. I'm going to use around six pounds of tomatoes and it's basically gonna take up this whole pan. I'm just gonna load it full. I'm not peeling the tomatoes, I'm just quartering them. Next, I've gotta peel this whole head of garlic because that's going on top of the tomatoes. I'm just using my fingers for this. See, this is the top of the garlic. I'm just peeling it back. The skin comes with. See, pretty easy. Next up, I have a nine by 13 Pyrex pan here. I'm gonna put half with jalapenos, half with onions. If you don't want your salsa to be hot, you can replace it with a sweet pepper. When all is said and done, I would say that this salsa isn't necessarily hot. It's definitely more on the mild side, but obviously when you include jalapenos, there is a little bit of a kick. Try not to cry. These are fresh out of the garden. Somehow warm onions are always the worst. <laughs> As far as the jalapenos go, I'm just gonna cut the tops off and then cut them in half. I'm gonna leave all of the seeds and everything just right in there. And if you felt like it, if you wanted to make it a little bit more mild, you could scoop the seeds out. The oven's not preheated yet, but that's really not essential that it be completely up to temperature before you put the trays in. I have it set for 375. I'm gonna put in the trays of veggies and let them roast for 45 minutes. It's been 45 minutes and this is what we're looking for. We've got some brown crispy tips. So now with a slotted spoon, I'm gonna move everything into this pot right here. I'm trying to make sure that the decent amount of the moisture stays in the pan and not in the pot. At this point, if you wanted to, you could remove the skins off of the tomatoes. I'm not gonna do that because it is a little bit more work and we don't find that it poses any kind of issues for us, but you could do that if you wanted. Next up, about a half tablespoon of salt. This is pink Himalayan. Quarter cup of lemon juice. So I've done two of these little eighth cup scoops here. <laughs> about two tablespoons of honey. Then I like to mix everything up using my stick blender. I have used a food processor in the past and I find that I get really inconsistent results with that. With this, I am able to better control what exactly I am pulsing up and I get a lot more of a consistent salsa that way. Looks like I actually ran out of cilantro, so I'm gonna add some parsley for color. I'm actually gonna use my steam canner to can the salsa up today. And a steam canner is an approved method for canning salsas and other acidic foods. But remember, this specific recipe is not an approved recipe, but this is an approved method. And I much, much prefer it over water bath canning. It takes so much less water and so much less time.
So I've done everything like I would if I was doing a regular water bath canning recipe. At the bottom of the steam canner here is three quarts of water and a splash of vinegar. I've turned the burner on high and I've got a gauge up here that's going to let us know when we should start our canning time. This is all based on altitude and for our elevation, I need to wait until the red indicator bar here makes it all the way into the dark green segment. I also find that when this thing really gets going, sometimes the steam makes the lid rattle a little bit, so I like to weight it down. So it looks like we got one bag of tomatoes cut up in the time that it took this to come to temperature. So you can see our gauge is in the dark green. I've set my timer for 15 minutes. And during that time, I am going to lower the temperature a little bit, but it's important for me to watch the canner and make sure that that gauge doesn't leave the dark green area. Tomato products are notorious for doing a thing called siphoning while they're cooling down after being processed. And basically what that is, is the tomatoes will kind of bubble up as the temperature change happens inside the jar. It can really affect the way that your jar is able to seal and can be quite a mess. To mitigate that problem, I'm going to tilt the lid of the steam canner to allow it to cool down more slowly and hopefully not siphon as badly, if at all. I'm gonna leave it tilted like this for 10 minutes and then I can remove the lid. Looks like we didn't have any siphoning, which is awesome. But I'm not sure if you caught it, but I only filled the jars up to this first ring here on the neck of the jar. A lot of recipes that involve tomatoes have you giving a quarter inch headspace. And that means a quarter inch of air space between the top of the food and the top of the jar. And I find that to be a really, really short margin for error, especially when it comes to tomatoes. So I'm a rule breaker a little bit when it comes to canning. And I decided that I was gonna fill my jars a little bit less and see if that helped and it does but again it's rebel canning <laughs> it's a little bit later in the day and the bag of tomatoes finally thawed out so i did drain the tomatoes over our pig feed bucket you can absolutely can that tomato juice and use it in things like soups or in place of water when you're doing rice and things like that I find it to be way too sweet. I don't like the flavor cooked into dishes like that, but you could. So this is what we've got. Most of the liquid is drained out of the tomato and then the skin, it slides right off, dripping. Once I am all done getting these tomatoes skinned and in the pot, I will no longer have 50 pounds of tomatoes. I'll have to look at the recipe more closely. It's something like 46 or 47 pounds that it calls for, but that accounts for tomatoes that are straight off the vine. Once they've released a lot of their water, like they have straight out of the freezer, they're going to weigh much less. These tomatoes actually sat in the fridge overnight after I had already peeled their skins off and they've released much more water overnight. Obviously, I don't want to take out all of the juice, but I really do enjoy a nice thick sauce. So I'm going to get out what I can. If you're going to be ladling out the juice like this, it's going to be important that you do so before you blend up the sauce. Otherwise, the only way to reduce it down and get the moisture out is to simmer the sauce for a little while. All the while here, I'm heating up the tomatoes. I'm gonna want to bring them to a simmer so that I can load my jars hot. It's really not smart to load cold jars into a canner. Even if you're starting with a cold canner, the canner can heat up really quickly, especially that steam canner, and the jars can crack. See how thick that is? The spoon doesn't even sink. 
and that's what I really like. I'm gonna go ahead and pre-season this. You can definitely just can up regular old tomato sauce and season it as you cook with it. I really like to use my tomato sauce as more of a dump and go, and I like to not think about it too much on the back end. If I can worry about the seasoning now, it'll make me much happier to not have to think about it later. <laughs> Somehow I've let myself run out of black pepper, so I'll have to worry about that later, but I am gonna need quite a lot of salt. Taste as you go, for sure. I'm gonna use granulated garlic in the sauce. Onion powder. Basil leaves. And dried oregano. Believe it or not, it needs more salt. The National Center for Home Food Preservation website says, to ensure the safe acidity in whole crushed or juiced tomatoes, add two tablespoons of bottled lemon juice or half a teaspoon of citric acid per quart of tomatoes. It says you can add sugar to offset the acidity. We can do that if we need to when we go to eat it, but I've got a big old bag of citric acid here. Don't ask me why I bought this huge bag. You really don't need a lot when you're canning. Just like the lemon juice we added to the salsa, this citric acid is gonna make sure that our tomato product is a safe acidity. Different tomatoes, different varieties of tomatoes, different ripenesses of tomatoes have differing levels of acidity and you want to have this acidity at a safe level so it's going to keep botulism out of your jar. Do you guys know what I forgot I had? I have these Mason Tops reusable rings and they're made for fermenting, but I also read that you could use them for water bath or steam canning. Let's do it. Regular old canning rings very readily get all rusty and gross and that makes them really hard to use long term. So here's the plastic version. Fingertip tight. I like to test these kind of things out. Like if I can pull it off easily, it's going to explode in the canner. And it only takes one canner explosion for you to be extra cautious, so. I have two boxes of these, but I'm gonna just use one box today. So we've got four of the Mason Tops reusable rings in there. As soon as the canner comes up to temperature, I'm going to start the timer for 40 minutes and then we can see how well those rings did. And while that canner is doing its thing, we're going to deal with the tomato skins that we've taken off of all of those tomatoes. It actually didn't fill as big as a bowl as you would expect, but we're going to be dehydrating these skins and turning this into this. We have an Excalibur food dehydrator. It is an amazing machine. It's one of those big square ones and it fits nine trays. We use it all the time, mostly in the fall time. We use it to make jerky, but I also like to use it during the growing season for things like this. And I also will dehydrate the plethora of cherry tomatoes that we usually get. A lot of times we just can't keep up with the fresh eating on those. And a dehydrated cherry tomato is basically just as good as a diced tomato. We use dehydrated tomatoes all the time in the winter and I have a bunch left over from last time. So I did not plant as many cherry tomatoes this year, but that's okay. This is what we're going for. It's not exactly a single layer, but it's not laid on super, super thick either. So these are gonna be in the dehydrator for several hours, four to five on the highest setting. I keep it on the jerky setting, just so it can penetrate all the layers of tomato skins here. I'm sitting here editing this video while I'm canning, and I have heard two mini explosions so far, so. What do you think? Is it the two metal bands that we put in there or is it some of those mason top bands? Dang it. The directions to my steam canner say when you shut it off, leave it on the burner with everything closed for five minutes. So I shut the burner off two minutes ago and I heard another pop. The really good thing about mini explosions <laughs> or when the top blows off in a steam canner is that you won't lose all of the contents or it won't be a giant huge mess. So if these jars were in a water bath, 
all of the contents of the jar will have come out into the water because in a water bath canner, the jar is submerged. And in a pressure canner, everything is at a decently high pressure and it just kind of explodes all over the canner and is a huge giant mess. In theory, all this will have done is gently volcanoed out. It's not, like I'm calling it a mini explosion, but it's clearly not the jar ceiling. It's going tink, but like, in an intense way. We can always reprocess the jars, which is what I will probably elect to do, or you can stick them in the fridge, just use them within the week. Oh, it was actually two mason tops and a metal one, so. It is now the next day and our tomato skins are nice and dry. They should be super, super dry, just as dry as like a pile of leaves in the fall. Hear that? I have this really nice spice grinder to use to make sure I get a really nice uniform powder. If you didn't have something like this or you don't have access to something like this, I'm 99% sure that you could put these inside like a Ziploc bag and use a rolling pin and get a really good powder that way. This is the end result that I'm looking for. It's a nice fine powder and I like to use it basically anywhere that calls for either tomato sauce or tomato paste in a recipe or anywhere that needs a little bit extra flavor or a little bit of a thicker consistency. One of my favorite ways to use this is to sprinkle a little bit into some ground meat. I don't like to drain the fat out of my meat. The fat is really good for you, but I also really don't like how greasy fat can be. And this takes care of that. It turns that fat into more of like a gravy. Super, super good. <laughs> of these five gram desiccant packs exactly for this kind of thing. This little size is the perfect size for small vessels like this. It's gonna help keep our powder nice and dry. And if I wanted to keep this for a longer term use, I could use my vacuum sealer with my mason jar attachment and take out all the extra air. But I know that we're gonna be using this pretty soon, so I'll go ahead and leave it just like that. It has been two days since we harvested the tomatoes at the beginning of this video, and it's already time to harvest again. These are great problems, we love to have them, but I gotta get to work. I'll leave this playlist up here, and I'll see you in the garden.